Chapter 1. The Meaning of Inflation One of the great farces of our day is the supposed war on inflation being waged by civil governments everywhere. In every continent, politicians pledge themselves to an all-out war on inflation, conveniently neglecting to state that the immediate cause of all inflation in the modern era is the increase of the supply of money and credit by the central civil or statist agencies. Inflation is an act of state, a very highly desirable act of state from the standpoint of politicians and the bureaucracy, because it increases vastly the powers of the state. The rise of the modern totalitarian state has its economic origin in the abandonment of gold coinage for paper money. As the creator of fiat money, of instant money by means of legalised counterfeiting of wealth, the state is always the wealthiest and most powerful force in society. As inflation increases, so too does the power of the state. Every civil government thus has a vested interest in inflation. For a state to halt inflation is to diminish its power. The cry, stop inflation, is another way of saying, castrate the state, and no state or bureaucracy has yet favoured its own castration. Inflation is thus a way of life to the modern humanistic power state because power is its goal. The fundamental premise of modern political science is that this state is God walking on earth. This same Hegelian and in origin pagan doctrine is basic to Marxism, fascism, Nazism, democracy, Fabianism and other modern political theories. It means that the state claims sovereignty an attribute of God alone, and therefore claims the power to create. The result of this assertion of sovereignty and the power to create is fiat laws, laws with no basis in God's law and purely arbitrary assertions of state, fiat money, money created by the state decree and having behind it the value of status coercion, and fiat everything. Above all, it means fiat justice. Justice ceases to be grounded in God's being and righteousness and is grounded instead in the arbitrary judgments and decisions of the state, its bureaucracy and its agencies. The more humanistic the power state becomes, the more it removes its lawmaking policies from the elective process. The goal of the humanistic state is to replace God as the ultimate power and authority over man and hence it works in the name of man to separate itself from man. Most lawmaking in the United States is not an act of Congress or of a state legislature, but of a bureaucracy which enacts vast powers unto itself through the federal register or in likewise. A sovereign power is always transcendental. It transcends those whom it governs. God is beyond man and nature and separate from them, Hence, we speak of the supernatural. Similarly, the would-be sovereign state seeks to be transcendental, beyond man in the name of man, and its rule becomes more and more a fiat, an arbitrary rule. The goal is total power. The key or the means is money, the creation of fiat money, in brief, inflation. When the state enters into the marketplace by means of wage and price controls, subsidies to either capital or labour or both, controls over agriculture, the creation of money and the manipulation of the money supply or like measures, the effect on the free market is immediate. While briefly stimulating the market, it in reality depresses it because it restricts freedom, affects prices and creates an artificial stimulus. Thus, the real effect of state intervention in the marketplace and into the money supply is a depressing effect a depression. The state, however, has one cure, a panacea for all ailments, more intervention. The result is inflation, and an inflation in the 20th century is simply a repressed depression. The state seeks, by means of more intervention, to undo the effects of its original intervention, and so on. Inflation thus has a religious root. It is a consequence of the attempt by the state to play God and to resolve all human problems, not by religious and moral answers derived from the Bible, but from humanism. 
The state believes that, by playing God, it can abolish the problems of man and society. Instead, it aggravates those problems. But is inflation only the work of the state? Clearly, its immediate cause is the increase of money and credit, and borrowing as well, by the state. This is very plainly true, and every attempt by statist apologists to shift the blame is false and immoral. But granted that the immediate mechanism of inflation is the state's monetary policy, and granted that behind that policy is a will to power, a will to be God, do the people have no responsibility? Are they simply the innocent victims of a status conspiracy? Let us look briefly at an aspect of inflation which is basic to its nature. Inflation is larceny. By cheapening the value of money, it robs creditors and rewards debtors. Of course, the inflating state in the process makes itself the leading debtor by deficit spending, by bond sales and by heavy borrowings to make possible its growing bureaucracy and power. As the leading thief, the inflating state is thus congenial to all thieves and it rewards debtors by encouraging debt. There is a benefit in income tax payments for interest payments on debt and no benefit for saving, being self-supporting and thrifty. In fact, such old-fashioned biblical morality is penalised. Thus, inflation is legalised larceny and it is an encouragement to all of us to take part in this legalised theft. In a very real sense, the federal government is in the business of encouraging thieves. When the lights went out in New York City during the 1970s in a power failure, large numbers of black looters began a massive assault on stores, vandalising and robbing them of millions of dollars in goods. It was very clearly a black mark against the Negro people It was lawlessness and looting on a large scale. No apology or excuse for it can be valid. However, another consideration should make us pause before we see the negro alone as the lawless element. The black looting was simplistic, unsophisticated theft. However, those same businesses were already in the process of being looted by the federal government in a more sophisticated way. On top of exorbitant taxes, these businesses faced the hidden taxation or theft of inflation. Their profits in prospect turned out to be less when in hand because inflation had eaten up about 10% of their value, a very real form of looting. The black looting in New York is occasional and limited. The status looting is total and continuous. But we have still to face our basic question. What is the role of the people in creating inflation? In 1936, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was embarking on his inflationary policies, Freeman Tilden in A World in Debt wrote about the two basic facts which mark the beginnings of any inflationary program. The first is the intent to falsify the economic position of a nation, to doctor the books as it were, to give a false picture. This falsification means relief for the debtor at the expense of the creditor. It means pitting the have-nots against the haves, creating a clash of interest. Of course, the doctrine of the harmony of interests is derided in favour of the conflict of interest. Whether intended or not, this falsified economic picture leads to socialism and totalitarianism because it rests on a doctrine the conflict of interests which posits class war, the necessity for the workers to suppress their enemies and the need for a dictatorship to enforce a class victory. The result is either communism, Fabianism, fascism or welfare democracy, all sisters under the same skin. Whether in a local bank or state treasury, a falsified economic position is prerequisite to inflationary theft. For the second basic fact, let us turn to Tilden's own telling words. Quote, Inflation, whether of bank credit or of paper currency, cannot be effective until the larcenous purpose is generally comprehended. 
This explains why in 1933 and 1934 in the United States the credit base was enormously extended without any considerable effect upon trade or employment. The credit simply lay inert. Businesses did not care to employ it normally and there was not sufficient fear to induce its abnormal use. In this period, 1933 to 1934, in the United States, prices rose, but not because of inflation. A similar case is observed in all paper money expansions. At first, the money makes only a short turn and goes back into the banks. Prices do not immediately rise because the fraudulent purpose is not understood. End quote. Here we come to the heart of the matter. Inflation is larceny, and it is indeed a kind of conspiracy. It cannot work until the larcenous state, and every inflationary state is a larcenous state, has a large number of allies among the people. These allies can be rich or poor, and they do include many corporations, indeed virtually all, and many of the poor, again virtually all. They also include many or virtually all of the middle classes, because larceny in the heart is no respecter of persons. The inducement is this, join us in debt, says the larcenous state, of course, as the creator of monetized debt, that is, as an agency which can legally turn its debts into money, the federal government is the real gainer in all such larceny. All the time, people of all classes and corporations of all sizes find larceny appealing and profitable, and hence they encourage the state in its course, and even more, demand a larcenous course. The larceny is, of course, disguised as charity, a concern for the social welfare, a humane public policy, a square deal, a new deal, a new frontier, and so on and on. Larceny is bad enough, but theft in the name of righteousness is the ultimate in hypocrisy and self-deception. Of course, inflation is bought in the name of goodness and a social concern by the people so that they might be thieves with a good conscience. Practically, the hope is to get something for nothing and to go into debt now in order to pay off good debts with cheap and progressively worthless money. Meanwhile, the larcenous state and people pride themselves on having a high morality and a tender conscience. Here, Teldon has a telling statement, quote, there is no sensibility so delicate and easily wounded as that of a person or a nation that knows it is in the wrong, end quote. A larcenous state prefers larcenous people. The income tax form clearly favours debtors rather than creditors. Should it surprise us, then, that the larcenous state is tender in its regard for the rights of a criminal, but not for the law-abiding citizen? People are of a piece morally, and the same is true of nations. No more than we can expect the Mafia to set up rescue missions for fallen women can we expect the larcenous state to favour the godly, productive and law-abiding man. This should not surprise us. Long ago, St. Augustine warned us that states without God or without his justice are like bands of robbers. Quote, Justice being taken away, then, what are kingdoms but great robberies? For what are robberies or bands of robbers themselves but little kingdoms? End quote. Augustine continued, quote, The band itself is made up of men. It is ruled by the authority of a prince. It is knit together by the pact of confederacy. The booty is divided by the law agreed on. If by the admittance of abandoned men this evil increases to such a degree that it holds the places fixes abodes, takes possession of cities and subdues peoples, it assumes the more plainly the name of a kingdom because the reality is now manifestly conferred upon it, not by the removal of covetousness, but by the addition of impunity. Indeed, that was an apt and true reply which that king had asked the man what he meant by keeping hostile possession of the sea. He answered with bold pride, what thou meanest by seizing the whole earth? But because I do it with a petty ship, I am called a robber, whilst thou who dost it with a great fleet are styled emperor. End quote. We are best prepared to deal with a thief if we recognize him as a thief. 
All too many people, however, believe that the best way to deal with a larcenous state is to become thieves also, that is, debtors in an inflationary economy. They moralise it very readily. After all, they will say, my assets are being liquidated by taxation and inflation. The only way I can protect myself is to expand my holdings by debt. I will therefore nullify the effect of inflation upon me. This is trying to nullify theft by theft. But there is a subtle evil in trying to profit by inflation. It gives a person a vested interest in the inflationary or larcenous state. Today there are numerous wealthy and not-so-wealthy conservatives who eagerly attend one conference after another on money and inflation. These conferences are very carefully advertised. Basic to their advertised appeal is a summons to protect yourself against inflation. The purpose of attending is to profit by inflation, a very different thing. One economist who tried to teach basic principles of economics to such conferences found them rude and hostile. He had sought to call attention to the total immorality of inflation when the conferees, immoral conservatives, wanted to know how to profit from it. Their excuse was self-righteous to the extreme. I'm trying to protect myself. But protection from inflation is not a complicated matter. It involves converting one's monetary assets into gold, silver, land, a home, the tools of one's trade and the like. These people were interested in more. Like the federal governments, they wanted to exploit inflation for their own power and profit goals. Such people soon develop a vested interest in inflation which manifests itself in their voting and their financial support of certain candidates. For them, quote, conservative and, quote, responsible candidates are those who use inflation to subsidise their class or group. They have become a part of the larcenous state. Such people are no threat to the larcenous state. They are subservient allies happy hangers-on who are ready to cash in on the larceny while sanctimoniously deploring it. They are the people who want the best of both worlds, who want to eat their cake and have it too. Such people would do well to remember and study the life of Cosimo de' Medici, one of the great experts in the philosophy of debt as a means to power. Cosimo de' Medici was a merchant and moneylender, He owned more than two and a half tons of fine gold. He ended the wars of three states by withdrawing credit. The Pope's mitre was in his possession, the Pope having pawned it for funds. In 1439, Cosimo de' Medici became ruler of Florence. It was easy for him to rule. He appealed to the rich as their champion against equalization and to the poor and the radicals as their hope against the rich. By encouraging debt, Cosimo de' Medici gained power because, as Solomon observed long ago, the borrower is servant, literally slave, to the lender. Proverbs 22.7 Cosimo de' Medici enslaved a republic and a people by means of debt. Debt was to him an easy means to power, so much so that, quote, he would have liked best, said Cosimo, to have God also among his debtors, end quote. To have God in his debt would have meant to have God in his power, conforming to his policies and playing his game. The larcenous state is an heir to Cosimo de' Medici. It is nothing to fear from most of the conferees who seek, quote, self-protection, end quote. They are a part of the state's entourage. The use of debt to enslave was not new in Solomon's day. It went back at least to the old Babylon of Hammurabi, one of the earlier humanistic states. Basic to conquest was the role of the Tamkaru, singular Tamkarum, who were moneylenders, government agents, merchants and bankers all rolled into one package. These Tamkaru were people who encouraged that, long before any army marched into an area, these Tamkaru had reduced its people to economic slavery by debt, Their spirit of independence had been sapped, their character corrupted and their economies geared to consumption rather than production. Assyria later used the same policy and the prophet Nahum cited it as a special sin of Assyria that it had, quote, 
multiplied merchants above the stars of heaven, end quote, Nahum 3.16. That is, had used moneylenders to promote economic slavery in one area after another. Solomon was thus commenting on an ancient and continuing practice of imperialism when he observed that, quote, the borrower is servant to the lender, Proverbs 22, 7. The federal government encourages debt in a number of ways which touch the lives of every man. One is to give a tax advantage to debtors. This makes it worthwhile to go into debt. After all, there is no tax deduction for rent payments. On the other hand, if one buys a home on a 20 or 30 year note, most of the payment is in interest and deductible, and the property tax in the house is also deductible. Very often, the difference between rent and payments for comparable housing is negligible in many areas. This is certainly an inducement to go into long term debt for housing. Another means whereby debt is encouraged is by the expansion of the money supply by increasing the availability of credit, that is, of borrowing. It is paradoxical that the word credit, coming from credo, I believe, has come to mean the availability of debt. A man who is a credit to his community is a man whose life is an asset to society, but to have credit increasingly means a cheaply available ability to contract debt. Debt and inflation are closely related and interwoven, Inflation means a cheapening of money. This has been done in a variety of ways throughout history. Clipping coins, that is, diminishing their size in order to have more gold for more spending, is an ancient method. Another is debasing the coinage, using baser metals exclusively or lowering the gold or silver content. Some coinage was merely washed in gold or silver to give a deceptive appearance. Henry VIII's coinage was so made and the first point to wear on his coins being the nose on his image thereon, he became known as Old Copper Nose. Another means of cheapening money is the printing of unbacked paper currency in increasing quantities, a feature of many modern inflations. More recently, another method has been brought to the forefront, increasing the availability of credit so that people are able to buy beyond their means and in terms of an inflated period of years of debt. This latter means of increasing the money supply points most obviously to the relationship of debt and inflation. Debt both cheapens money and it cheapens time. Jacob agreed to work seven years for Laban in order to accumulate a diary to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. Genesis 29.18 Normally, a diary in Israel was equal to three years' income. There was thus a time factor in marriage. The necessary capital had to be accumulated first. Marriage was thus a serious and costly step, not lightly or casually taken. In modern marriage, no such time factor exists. The personal and economic as well as social significance of marriage has been cheapened. A young couple can move into a better home with better furnishings than their parents and do it by debt. Divorce and bankruptcy provide also an easy release. Debt cheapens time. For a young man to commit himself to three or seven years of labour before marriage requires both an appreciable evaluation of the prospective bride and of his time. For a young man, however, to sign a mortgage for a house at $80,000 when an escape clause from both debt and marriage are easily available and when inflation can in five years double the paper value of his house, it is an entirely different matter. Time, debt, and the girl are all cheapened. An old proverb with many sources in the ancient world declared, Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In the 20th century, Lord Keynes, when asked about the future, given his economics, answered in a like vein, In the long run, we are all dead. Ropka, in commenting on the attention Keynes received for this banal and cynical observation, wrote, quote, And yet it should have been obvious that the remark is of the same decidedly unbourgeois spirit as the motto of the Ancien Régime, Après nous le déluge. 
It reveals an utterly unbourgeois concern for the future, which has become the mark of a certain style of modern economic policy and inveigles us into regarding it as a virtue to contract debts and as foolishness to save, end quote. As Ropka pointed out, the erosion of money and the erosion of property go together. Each promotes the other. Both are linked to an erosion of the value of time. Debt and the future are nothing. The slavery of debt is nothing, quote, for tomorrow we die, or we walk away by declaring bankruptcy, as individuals or as a nation. The implications of the biblical law forbidding long-term debts begin now to emerge. It is in part a legislation against inflation. Several laws in the Bible deal with debt. One of these is Deuteronomy 15, 1-6. Its premises and requirements with respect to economics include, first, a distinction between free men and natural slaves. The covenant man, God's man, is and must be a free man. Quote, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 The covenant man must not place himself in a position of slavery or bondage. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants or slaves of men. 1 Corinthians 7.23 The ungodly are, however, slaves by nature. They will in some form or another enslave themselves to something, no matter how great their position may be. Second, God's covenant man cannot mortgage his future. He belongs to God. As a general policy, he must, as Paul sums it up, owe no man anything but to love one another, Romans 13, 8. In the event that he must, for necessity, contract a debt, it must be for a period of no more than six years. Since a seventh-year cancellation of debts between covenant men was required, debts could not be contracted unless such a short-term payment were clearly feasible. The future of the covenant man, as does his whole life, belongs to God. He cannot sell himself to men by means of debt. Third, long-term debts are legal for the ungodly and not subject to cancellation in the seventh or Sabbath year because all such men are by nature slaves and cannot be legislated out of their slavery. The limitation of the term of debt is thus not a penalty on the godly, but a privilege. Freedom is their life, their duty, and their privilege. All too many Christians view this law, and all of the law, as a restraint on their freedom. For the ungodly, it is very obviously a restraint. The entelechy of their being is plainly described in Proverbs 8.36, where wisdom declares, quote, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, all they that hate me love death. End quote. The freedom sought by the unbelieving is a suicidal freedom. The freedom from debt required of the covenant man is a freedom for life, not for death, and to view this as a restraint is insanity. Fourth, freedom from debt is declared to be basic to the elimination of poverty. Quote, there shall be no poor among you. Deuteronomy 15.4, Berkeley Version. A society which lives in terms of God's laws concerning debt will be an inflation-free society because it will eliminate national, institutional, family and personal debts. The fuel which fires inflation is a desire to contract debts and at the same time to at least partially avoid repayments on debts. It is the desire to convert debt a liability into an asset. It is, of course, an aspect of the economic falsification that inflation produces, that debts become assets. The state carries this to the ultimate degree. It monetizes debt. Currency is created out of debt. We have here an aspect of man's ancient dream to be God, and like God to create out of nothing. Poverty, a form of slavery, is inescapable in an inflationary society. Inflation is a form of expropriation. The assets of creditors are expropriated by debtors. As a result, to participate in this expropriation, corporations, institutions, workers, farmers, all groups and classes enter happily into the legalised larceny. 
Their anticipation is that all will profit. The larcenist state, however, as the promoter of mass larceny, begins then to rob its lesser partners with the end result that all are impoverished and the state itself collapses. Inflation always leads to socialism or collapse. Socialism is, like inflation, a parasitic economy. When a parasite destroys a host body, the parasite also dies. Mistletoe, a parasite, can kill a tree finally, and when it does, the mistletoe also dies. Inflation impoverishes and finally destroys all. Fifth, whereas the larcenist state sees inflation and debt as the means to power, God's law states that a debt-free people and nation shall attain to true world power, quote, For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Deuteronomy 15.6 Sixth, this law of debt is a Sabbath law. The Sabbath means rest, forgiveness, a debt-free life, and the privileges of freedom. The biblical law of debt is an aspect of its anti-inflation legislation. Another important biblical law is Leviticus 19, 35-37, which deals with just weights and measures. Weights in the Bible includes and often means money, since money in the Bible means weights of gold and silver. Compare 1 Chronicles 21, 25. Instead of money being monetized debt, it was real wealth in gold and silver. God indicts Judea in Isaiah 1.22 for its debased weights of silver for fraudulent money. A false weight is declared by Ezekiel to be despoiling the people and contrary to law and justice, Ezekiel 45, 9 and 10. Thus, any monetary standard which departs from a hard money position is injustice and a factor of central significance in inflation and larceny. Of course, taxation, like inflation, is a means of expropriation used by the larcenous state to confiscate wealth. Biblical law denies the state any taxing power other than a very limited head or poll tax on all males over 20 years of age and the same amount for all, Exodus 30, 11-16. The basic social financing is to be not by the state but by the tithe, which must finance religion, education, health, welfare, etc. But to return to the causes of inflation in the mind and heart of man, a key factor is covetousness, something plainly forbidden by the Tenth Commandment. To covet in the Bible means to desire and to seek to gain by fraudulent means that which belongs to another. Such a lawless possession can be made illegal by acts of state so that covetousness can be legal before the state. It remains always, however, an act of lawlessness before God. St. Paul in Colossians 3.5 speaks of covetousness as a form of idolatry. It is the idolatry of the self, man making himself God. The covetous man does not, as a friend, admire with respect the goods of another man or his wife. Rather, whatever he sees and wants, he seeks to possess in contempt of God's law covetousness fuels the forces which lead to inflation. More than little advertising appeals to covetousness. People are encouraged to think, I deserve the best, and then to incur debt to gain it. Thus, the war on inflation is a farce. The federal government creates inflation, needs it to maintain and increase its powers, and would be castrated without it. The people similarly like inflation, It gratifies their covetousness and gives them the happy facility of committing larceny legally. Of course, after a certain point, inflation has very unhappy consequences for all concerned, and bitterness, resentments, and hostilities increase. Then begins the morally convenient game of conspiracy hunting. The state blames the people, the speculators, the hoarders, the easy living mentality, the capitalists for raising prices, to meet inflation, and the workers for demanding higher wages to cope with inflation. The people blame the state establishment, the oil companies, the bankers, and so on. Each side infers that a conspiracy exists on the other side. 
none will admit that their way of life requires inflation. All want the other side to tighten its belt and economize. Before inflation begins, however, there must be an inflated lifestyle, or at the least inflated expectations about life. The inflationary mentality is geared to consumption, not production. For the inflationary mentality, being alive means having title to maximum rights, privileges, assets and freedom with little or no responsibility. The inflationary mentality despises God's law in favour of human rights. In brief, it wants a problem-free world, which is another way of saying that the inflationary mentality chooses death and loves it. Proverbs 8.36